Hi everyone and welcome back to Crops TV. My name is Erin Hodson and I'm an entomologist at Iowa State University. And along with my co-author, Ashley Dean, we're going to be talking about sort of the surprise pest of 2021 fall armyworm. So this is my outline today and I hope at the end of the video you'll have a better under understanding of how to identify fall armyworm and the life cycle and why the life cycle is important and be able to recognize injury even in the absence of fall armyworm and give you some tips for sampling this pest in a number of different crops. And then finally wrapping up by giving you some management options for this pest. Now armyworms and cutworms belong in a caterpillar family known as a noctuity and sometimes they're called owlet moss and this family is the second largest moth family with over 12,000 species in the world. There are about 2,500 species in North America alone and most of them probably could be described as drab, gray or brown moths and the wings are held flat over the body. I would consider this family to have fairly stout bodies and fairly hairy bodies compared to other moths. Now the larvae would be considered more smooth. They do have some hairs, but they're not spiny or covered with hairs like some caterpillars. And most of them are blending into the landscape. So they're green or brown or could be gray in color. Now fall armyworms have been around for a long time, but we would generally consider them a tropical pest and native to the tropical Americas. However, in the last five years, they've had a rapid global expansion to Australia, Southern Asia, and almost all over Africa. I would consider fall armyworm in the more northern states and regions and into Canada, uh, it's considered an occasional pest, but really the, they prefer tropical climates. Here's a picture of the adult fall armyworm with a relative wingspan of an inch or maybe an inch and three quarters. It's probably smaller than you think, and it's probably smaller than a lot of the other little brown moths that we're likely to see in Iowa. The forewings are gray with mottled spots. You can see the hind wings are kind of a creamy, transparent color, and the w males have a whitish patch near the wingtip. So this is a side shot of the fall armyworm shown in this photo. But you can see how hairy the body is, and uh, it's covered with scales all over the forewings as well. You probably most often confuse fall armyworm with true armyworm, except the true armyworm is larger, has a wingspan that's over two inches, and the adults have a white dot on the forewing that can be characteristic of the species. You also could confuse it maybe with black cutworm. It, the true armyworm and black cutworm are also migratory species that come into the Midwest every year. However, the black cutworm, again, is larger. Its wingspan is over two inches, and it has a characteristic black dagger on the forewing, and the often has a light band near the wingtip. And so hopefully you'd be able to distinguish these, although when you see them in the field, of course, their wings aren't going to be nicely spread out. They're gonna be um, either flying around or stuck on a sticky trap, which makes it harder for, to see some of these characteristics. Now, when it comes to the larvae, I also think they stand out compared to other armyworms and cutworms. They have an inverted white Y on the head capsule, and this is actually a suture on the head, which all caterpillars have, except for fall armyworm, that suture is very distinctly white compared to other species. They also have four raised dots that look like a square at the end of the abdomen. Um, it, is, it does have four pairs of pro legs, like all armyworms and cutworms, so that's not any different. And again, they don't have a very hairy body, but it's brown, it's mottled, it can have a number of different stripes running from the head to the tip of the abdomen, and it has black bumps, uh, kind of like you'd see with black cutworm. I just wanted to show you kind of a close-up again, those two characteristic features. You have the inverted Y, and then the four raised bumps on the end of the abdomen. So hopefully you'd be able to distinguish it with other armyworms and cutworms. But easier said than done. There's a lot of caterpillars, especially in corn and other armyworms and cutworms that you can see along in this photo. Again, they all have the four pro legs, armyworms and cutworms. They can be modeled full of stripes, especially true armyworm and yellow striped armyworm. But they're going to be missing that characteristic inverted Y in the head capsule. 
Like all caterpillars, they'll go through complete life cycle and it's all temperature driven. So in the peak of the summer, especially in the southern states of the U.S., they can have a generation in as quick as 30 days. But in the spring or the fall, when temperatures are cooler, especially at night, the generation may take up to 60 days. And then where they do spend the winter in the southern parts of the U.S., they may have a generation that takes up to 90 days. So the good news is they're unable to die a pause, so they don't have a resting part of the life cycle, which can survive our cold, freezing temperatures. And so the armyworms that come here to the Midwest are not going to make it back, so they're not going to survive. And so we have to depend on the annual migration of fall armyworm into the Midwest every year. But when they do get here, as the common name suggests in the fall, I would say they have one, maybe a second partial generation in the Midwest. So I just want to give you some more information about the life cycle, and we'll start with the eggs. A female can lay 2,000 or more eggs in a lifetime, which is pretty fantastic. And at any one time, they're going to be laying 100 to 200 eggs per mass on vegetation and other human structures. Now, what's unusual about this is that the females will cover those egg masses in scales from the body, and I think it provides a uh, protection from predators and desiccation. So to me, the eggs look furry or moldy, and they're gonna hatch after about two days. And so the egg masses look really unique compared to other species. Now the larvae go through six instars, and they're going to be getting bigger and also eating more with each instar. The final instar is about an inch and a half long. And again, depending on the temperatures, it could be 14 to 21 days of feeding through those six instars before they pupate. They're going to move into a resting pupil stage that's in the soil, and it has a very characteristic noctuid-type pupil case that you can find in the soil. And then lastly is the adult. They live for about two to three weeks, mating, feeding, and laying eggs. And again, it's a, a huge number of eggs that a female can deposit in her life. I think this photo here is fantastic, so thank you Auburn University for uh, supplying this graphic on relative size of each instar. And so I think as you move from a neonate, which is a caterpillar that is just hatched from the egg, it's just over a millimeter in length, you can see as it goes through the six instars, they get quite a bit bigger, again reaching about an inch and a half in size when fully developed right before pupation. It's important to know or to be able to distinguish the different instars. I think most people can recognize the six instar in the field, but the earlier instars are harder to distinguish between other armyworms and cutworms. So initially scouting should be focused on the smaller ones. They're easier to kill, and also they're eating quite a bit less than the bigger instars. So another way to look at it is this relative amount of food that each larval stage is going to eat. And again, 14 days would sort of be optimal growth in the tropics that probably don't move through the instars quite as fast here in Iowa. But the green cubes represent approximately how much food they eat. And so those first five instars consume still less food than that final six instar. So scouting and making treatment decisions when the larvae are small is a more effective way to pr protect that crop because the injury is quite a bit less than, those last, than that last instar. Okay, so many questions that we saw in 2021 about why. Why this year? The last time we heard about fall armyworm being a problem in the Midwest was in the 1970s. And I had to hear about that from people that were actually farming in the 1970s. I wasn't an entomologist back then. So uh, they talked about some really high pressures, it destroyed crops, and it was widespread kind of outbreaks. And so, you know, why 2021? You know, life was hard enough as it is, and then we add fall armyworm to the mix. And so I asked our state climatologist, Dr. Justin Glisson, about why this year? What was the setup that made this migratory pest so important? And he did share some information for, for me, with me, and just to summarize some of his thoughts, it's kind of a wordy slide, but basically he said, we were in a La Nina from late 2000 into the spring of 2021. And this cold phase uh, really pushed a lot of violent thunderstorms and weather activity into uh, the Pacific Basin. And it makes uh, four tropical storms. We had several different hurricanes in 2021 in, those vi in that violent weather, along with the combination of 
a mild winter in 2021 and uh, these long periods of drought in the south followed by these tropical storms, he said, kaboom, it's a perfect storm. So you have a dry period with more larvae overwintering than typically would because it was a mild winter. You had a violent storm that picked up these pests and not, not only fall armyworm, but potato leaf hopper, black cutworm and true armyworm, and even corn earworm. So we have a number of migratory pests that come from the south and they were brought up on these southerly winds and then dropped down into the Midwest. And so just record breaking numbers because they had a lot of uh, fall armyworms in the south to, to uh, be picked up by these storms. And so he said that expect with warmer, wetter climate in the world, pests are expected to increase their migration numbers into the Midwest. So we can expect not only fall armyworm, but other migratory pests to become more common issues uh, for our agriculture. So I guess that's not such great news, but thanks, Justin. And so um, with that foundation of biology and life, life cycle descriptions, I wanted to provide some tips for recognizing injury and more effective scouting for this pest because they can be feeding in a lot of different crops. Now, as the common name suggests, fall armyworm, our first detections in Iowa are usually in August, but depending on how many storms come up from the south, we could have additional migration events happening in September as well. As I mentioned, they have a very wide host range, and to the best of my understanding, there are two genetic strains. There's a rice strain, which prefers to feed on grasses, and then a corn strain, which basically feeds on everything else. So what strains we had in Iowa, I have no idea because we had severe injury in grasses and in corn, alfalfa, soybean, turf grass, uh, athletic fields, many, many different types of plants were injured. So my best guess is that we likely had a mixture of the rice strain and the corn strain, but there's no visual differences. And so the only way to confirm that would be through a genetic test. And so that's my just best guess of 2021 and likely other previous growing season as well that we have a mixture of strains. So different ways that we can have a first detection of the moss moving into our area is to use a black light because the moss like to move at night and also using a sex baited pheromone trap like shown on the right. So we do this very frequently for a couple other migratory moths, black cutworm and true armyworm, although we haven't specifically set up a fall armyworm trap just because the numbers have been fairly low over the last decade or, decade or so. But this would be something that would be commercially available is to buy this trap and a pheromone bait and put it in those areas of high value uh, crops, specifically corn, uh, or some of the pastures, grasslands, and then you'd be able to know when fall armyworm got to your farm or farms. I think it's fairly unusual. I talked about those egg masses that are look like they're furry or moldy. Well, the females seem to have no problems at all laying their egg masses on human structures. So here are some pretty extreme examples of females laying eggs on structures like posts, shingles, siding, other uh, barns and storage areas, fences, and everything else. So you can see these really furry egg masses and they really stand out, especially when there's hundreds of egg masses on a single structure. Uh, also, the golfers of the world were pretty annoyed because not only were they causing injury to the turf, and it's a high value uh, crop, of course, or a high value system with a golf course, but they were laying eggs all over the flags and some of the other markers on golf courses and really upsetting some of uh, uh, those golfers around Iowa. It got the field agronomist very excited for an, a, an event we were at in southern Iowa. They noticed all these egg masses and then just the floor, which was concrete, was crawling with different stages of fall armyworm. And so they got very excited about that activity, which I thought it was a little weird, but uh, hey, that's what we get excited about. So um, it was very easy to see them, especially on those structures. And I don't know why they like to lay their eggs on things that you know people build, but um, they're of often associated with grass or something next to it that they had no problems finding and they're fairly mobile. So I'll talk about that in just a moment. So the larvae, as the name suggests, are armyworms and they can appear very quickly and their injury can appear near, it seems like overnight, so very quickly. And they're highly mobile. So once they hatch out from that egg mass, the first instars 
can move to new foliage and there's usually hundreds laid in a single area. So you have hundreds and hundreds of larvae moving to new foliage. So the little ones, the, the, the smaller instars, tend to leave the main stems behind, but the larger ones can consume entire plants, especially if they're in the early vegetative stages. And from a distance, the armyworm injury can look similar to drought, system, drought symptoms in which you have patches that wilt or brown or die very quickly. So from the road, it appears like drought, but if you take a closer look, you're gonna see basically the ground moving with armyworms. So I have a couple of close-ups here showing severe injury to a crown. Um, oftentimes, again, for corn, they like to eat the leaves, uh, but later in the season uh, is really when we have fall armyworm problems, and so they can get into the ear and cause a lot of kernel injury to the ear tip, and that allows other pests to move in. They're very attractive to birds, and so sometimes you can have some ear injury uh, that is in addition to just the armyworms themselves. And then if the husks are open, sometimes it allows pathogens to enter and infect those injured kernels, and you end up with some toxin issues later in the season, which could greatly affect the quality and the quantity of grain produced. So when it comes to timing your scouting efforts for fall armyworm, I have a couple of tips for you. Uh, I would prioritize your most valuable areas or crops first, like corn or soybean, or if you had more valuable hay fields or pastures, depending on the purpose of the crop. And so I would scout those first, and likely because fall armyworm has multiple migrations into Iowa, when you scout, you're going to find mixed ages. So you're likely going to find small larvae and big larvae as well. So if most of them are large, they're fifth and sixth instars, know that they're wrapping up their feeding fairly quickly, and you may not even be able to time a treatment when the larvae are still feeding. But if most of the larvae are small, say they're first to third instars, you know they have quite a while left to feed and a lot more food to eat. And so that is also really important information to understand. They seem to be more attracted to crops that are highly fertilized and irrigated. So I would prioritize those versus those that are not as well fertilized. And for first detection, if you are scouting and you just wanna know if they're there or not, I think a sweep net is a great tool to be able to see those very small first, second, and third instars. Because again, if most of, the, of what you're looking at are fifth and sixth instars, know that they are sort of wrapping up their life cycle fairly quickly. Whatever you're doing, uh, if you're using a sweep net, um, if you're looking at injured plants, you'd want to estimate activity by larvae per square foot whenever possible. So approximately one sweep is a three linear feet. So you can say approximately 20 sweeps or whatever you're doing and then take the number of larvae per sweep. So you'd walk away with a number of density from every scouting effort. So with that scouting information, what do you do with that? So we'll talk just a little bit about management options. When it comes to fall armyworm, there are several tactics that you can use depending on the crop, which are more effective than others. So I'm just going to touch on a few of these when it comes especially to fall armyworm, but they would apply to a lot of other caterpillars that we're seeing in crops. I think for caterpillars, they're very commonly attacked by natural enemies. So we have predators, pathogens, and parasitoids. So it's great if you feel comfortable identifying fall armyworm compared to other armyworms and cutworms, that is a really important step. But it's also good to know when the caterpillars start to look a little off. Um, they could be bloated, off color, maybe they look like a powdered donut or fuzzy, furry, uh, you'd want to know when things start to look a little bit off. It may be a good sign of natural control in the area. Also, caterpillars are relatively easy pickings for predators like beetles, lacewings, true bugs. And so they often are a food source for of natural enemies in a number of different crops. And then we have some parasitoid wasps. You can see the picture on the left um, has been attacked by wasps. And you can have wasps that feed on the inside or you have like in this picture, wasps or flies that can attack and basically have feeding from the outside, which is pretty fantastic. So again, know when a caterpillar looks normal and then know when it starts to look a little off too because once the predators, pathogens, and parasitoids become active, you can have a very quick suppression of caterpillar activity. 
But it's hard to have both natural enemies and the constant use of synthetic insecticides. And so if possible in around hay fields, pastures, alfalfa, is to leave refuge strips or anything that is blooming, especially on borders. That's going to attract parasitoids and predators. And then I think, again, if you are paying attention to Allison Robertson, she often talks about the disease triangle. And you need the susceptible hosts, which caterpillars are very susceptible. You need pathogens, which we have a number of fungal, bacteria, bacterial, and viral pathogens, and then favorable environments, which usually means high humidity and temperatures. So windrows or areas where you have high residue temperature and moisture is you can have a good setup for these triangles of disease in which you can have fungal outbreaks. So again, look at the windrows, see if you have any caterpillars that are starting to look a little fuzzy. You could have very quick suppression of full armyworm, which is great. Probably the most preferred method for taking care of fall armyworm is harvest or mechanical control. And so depending on the crop, of course, um, early cutting can greatly reduce the amount of activity and most importantly, the injury that it causes. And in addition, the raking of post-harvest stubble can kill or cause uh, great injury to the fall armyworms as well. And then just having a early harvest, if it's a, if it's a, a suitable setup, for the crop can cause starvation, desiccation, and UV exposure. So especially if you have a lot of small larvae, they are mobile, but it will take some time for them to move across ditches, across roads, to find new foods, and sometimes they just don't make it. And so the starvation tactic caused by mechanical control can be very effective in some situations. So again, if you have uh, ability to feed uh, those areas or graze with cattle, that can cause significant improvements in, this, in the suppression of armyworms. So they are going to kill the eggs and eat the, eat the caterpillars as well with no effects to their digestive system. So that's great. Uh, some people put out cattle in heavily infested areas, uh, although those areas might be stressed because of all the armyworm feeding. And so recommending a rest before grazing again would be really important so they can resume some growth so you're not grazing uh, areas that are heavily stressed. And then uh, switching gears a little bit from mechanical control is talking about host plant resistance. This really plays into uh, effect when I'm talking about corn production. So either field corn or sweet corn. Uh, in the available resources, you're gonna notice a, a link for the handy BT trait table, which I've shown you the example here, but it's too small to read, um, but it gives you some options for different trait families uh, that are associated with suppression or control of different insects like fall armyworm, and then the herbicide tolerance that comes along with that. So this is a great resource. It's free through the Texas A&M website and is updated every year because there have been lots of changes to pest susceptibility to different BT traits. And so from this table, you'd be able to see that fall armyworm is susceptible to Cry1F, Cry2AB2, and VIP3AA20. Uh, at least we've had fairly good control of these traits with fall armyworm in the Midwest. Although there has been some documented resistance to Cry1F out in the southern and eastern states. But so far in Iowa, it seems to be holding up. And I think largely that's due to be because they show up later in the season and they just don't have the numbers except for 2021 um, to show that they're susceptible or resistant. So fairly good control with that. But it is important to keep in the loop, not only with fall armyworm, but corn rootworm, European corn borer, and other pests associated with corn. For those that grow sweet corn, BT foliar sprays may provide some suppression, but the caterpillars have to be accessible. So once they get in and around the ear, they become much less effective. And so the timing is very critical for good suppression. And then lastly, uh, chemical control, as I listed, uh, is a possible management tool. I would consider it a, a last resort for fall armyworm. In most years, they're not a problem. And we always have a little bit of fall armyworm, and it's generally not an economic concern. You know, 2021 was unprecedented, and so that's why I'm talking about it today. I don't know if it'll take another 40 years for us to think about fall armyworm or not, but um, it is something that's likely going to become more of a persistent issue just based on it changes to our climate. And so again, crop purpose and crop value should be considered because there's very high 
market values, very low market values, and so that plays into the effect on whether a treatment is profitable or not. So if you have a high market value crop or something that you can upgrade to say feed for horses, you know, you tend to treat more often than low value crops. And the crop purpose, whether it's for seed grade, food grade, whether it's in the animal food chain, has to be taken in consideration as well. So especially for hay fields and pastures, we have to know not, that not every application of insecticides is going to be profitable. So there might be some situations where we incur losses because of that. And especially if the, most of the larvae or the caterpillars are big, um, we may not actually be spraying anything at that time because they've already completed their life cycle. And I've heard of, of certain situations where we ha can have a resurgence of other pests. So say we decide to treat for fall armyworm in August, it's hot and dry, and we actually end up with more of a spider mite issue that can persist in grasses, alfalfa, corn, other crops as well. So something to consider is that the application of insecticides can cause a resurgence of some secondary pests in our state of Iowa. And so with careful sampling, you'd have a good understanding of the size and where those caterpillars are feeding. To target small larvae, it'd be a more effective because it's, it's easier to kill a small caterpillar and a large caterpillar, but also because um, you're gonna prevent a lot of injury from occurring later in the season. I would look at the label. Of course, the label's a law, and it will have a recommended rate and application, including volume, pressure, and even in some cases, nozzle types for the most effective uh, application or knockdown of that, of that pest. And so I would use a full rate when you decide to spray and just increasing high volume and pressure, the odds of making good contact and good knockdown are really critical for pre preventing additional sprays later in the season. I would say uh, targeting the sprays at dawn and dusk is a good strategy because that's when they're gonna be most actively feeding and moving. So during the peak temperatures of the day, they're going to seek refuge under residue on the undersides of leaves, cracks and crevices, um, or within the, uh, within the plant ears uh, and under that tissue. And so uh, in order to make contact, you want those droplets to touch the body and have good knockdown that way. So spraying during dawn and dusk increases those odds. And then based on your sampling efforts, if you're sampling entire fields or hay fields, you would have a good understanding if the infestation is fairly uniform or if it's aggregated near a field edge or sort of a hot spot. So if at all practical, consider a spot treatment, especially if you own your own equipment, in order to save on treatment costs as well. So that's also another option are spot treatments uh, for fall armyworm. Again, I refer back to the label. Remember, we want to be following that. So for some crops, we have to follow the B rule. So if a plant is blooming, we want to avoid sprays during that time. And actually, it's a good fit for fall armyworm because that's when they'll be most actively feeding and moving is at dawn and dusk. And when it comes to some of those crops that we're feeding or grazing, or we have to cut like alfalfa multiple times in a season, it's really important to look at the label and note the pre-harvest interval. Sometimes the pre-harvest interval, interval can be 14 days and that could interfere with your cutting cycle as far as relative feed value and other things that um, you, you want to be going on with the farm. So it's important to note that, but then also they might have instructions for applications per cut or per season, or if you have special feeding or grazing instructions uh, as well. And uh, you'll notice on this label here, it says use higher rates for large larvae. And so if you happen to have most of the fall armyworms that are fourth, fifth, or sixth instars, you would use a higher rate than say, if they were first, second, or third. So you're using more product in order to get a better knockdown of the pest. Okay, when it comes to economic thresholds for fall armyworm in pastures, alfalfa, and even cover crops, I have a general treatment guidelines based on intensity or, or injury. And so my best recommend, recommendation in general is two to three larvae per square foot or about 30 to 50% injured terminals. So depending on the crop. Uh, note that really high pressures of fall armyworm, uh, especially when they're doing a lot of defoliation, can prevent greening up. So checking the stubble is really important. And because they gonna tend to or want to move as soon as that crop is cut or sprayed, and so to scout neighboring fields is really important because 
again, almost overnight, they can move very great distances to find new tissue to feed on. If applications had to be made where you're spraying multiple times in one growing season, I would really recommend rotating the group numbers in order to minimize the chances of developing resistance of that uh, fall armyworm to those common group numbers that we're spraying. When it comes to corn, the threshold is a little bit different, but generally I don't hear, I didn't hear about injury to corn ears unless they were very late planted or late maturing. That seems to be an area, those, those fields are most attracted to fall armyworms that are migrating into the state. So they can cause direct injury to the corn ear and also indirect injury where they're consuming leaf tissue. You'd wanna be scouting on a regular basis, especially in late planted fields. And then also be looking for small larvae, small larvae. So once they get into the ear, they're generally not accessible by our foliar insecticides, foliar insecticides. And so you'd want to be treating when you have small larvae that are visible. And the treatment guideline sounds pretty incredible, but I'm just basing that on our colleagues to the south that say a treatment guideline of spraying at 25% infested is their best bet for making profitable decisions. So of course, I didn't see anything like that even in 2021, so I'm not sure how often an economic threshold for fall armyworm and corn happens, uh, especially in the Midwest, but it would be important to know if you hit that benchmark, it's likely time to make a spray. And again, once that field has been sprayed or if, it's, um, if you had grassy areas uh, around that field is to note that you have some migration to neighboring fields once that uh, plant or that crop has been considered unpalatable. So scouting neighbor fields is really important too. And then again, if you had to spray multiple times in one season, especially if you're spraying for say fall armyworm and then corn rootworm in the same growing season is to rotate the group numbers so that you're not using the same mode of action multiple times in one season. So this is a busy slide and I don't mean for you to read this. I have converted this information into another additional resource that you can see uh, in the description of my video. But I wanted to give you some examples of foliar insecticides that you can use for fall armyworm. Now remember, the label is the law and what I'm presenting here is to the best of my knowledge that you could spray in 2021, but 2022 is going to be a little bit different story, especially with the uh, revoking tolerances to chlorpyrifos, which is uh, group 1B. But what I've shown in these boxes here, thanks to uh, the help of Caitlin Keschmeyer from Auburn, is active ingredients, showing you that we have a handful of active ingredients that we can use, examples of products. This is just one example I tried to pick from many different insecticides that are labeled uh, with different group numbers in Iowa, how it kills, and most of the time it's by contact or ingestion. And then any notes about residuals, there are some that have a very low residual and some that have a little bit longer residual. And you can imagine high residual equals more dollar signs. So uh, the shorter residual are generally cheaper to spray and therefore probably most often used. And then it has some notes about pre-harvest interval and then grazing as well. And so there's just a wide variety of products that you can use depending on the crop and depending on the market value. And so some of these are fairly easy and expensive, good access. Other products are more difficult to find and would be more expensive to apply. So again, I'm not going to go into details about this, but that resource would provide you with the same information in a table form. So I encourage you to look at that. Okay, and then I got two awesome pictures from field agronomist Angie Rekins reminding us to be patient and that those crops, especially with timely rains that we had this fall, can have tremendous regrowth and resuming vegetation uh, later on in the season. So you see the field on the left, it looks pretty much on its way out. It's been, it looks burnt to a crisp, but really the floor is moving with fall armyworms. Well, a timely rain and two weeks later, and there was quite a bit of growth and it really greened up. And so I have some hope for the 2022 season in those areas that got some rain and regrowth that it's not going to be too stressful for the 2022 season, but we'll have to wait and see uh, how that plays out. But to know that a little bit of patience plants have a lot of resiliency and can bounce back. And so some take home points here, uh, talking about fall, fall armyworm, I would consider it an occasional pest. 
It's a migratory pest that shows up every year in Iowa. It's just 2020, 21. It was, sorry, 2021 was unprecedented. Uh, we note activity and injury in corn, forages, and grasses. And we really noticed it, especially with the mild fall that we had in August and September, and even to October, armyworms are still active. And so we did notice a pretty extended feeding period because we really didn't have a frost that takes these uh, fall armyworms out. And so basically they'll, they'll feed until they freeze. And um, although, you know, I don't know what to expect for 2022 and beyond, I think it's worth our time to be doing more scouting in the fall for these crops and expect to see more fall armyworm, at least at some level in Iowa and actually the Midwest um, with our changing climate. So it is not hard to find me. I'm going to be tweeting about not only this migratory pest, but other migratory pests that come into our field crops and pastures, hay fields as well. And I'll be posting degree day updates, management implications, especially with the loss of chlorpyrifos in our website newsletter called ICM News, and then more informal updates through ICM blog. So I encourage you to visit those next summer. And then again, seek out those resources, the BT trait table and foliar insecticide options uh, as guidelines for making treatment decisions next year. So thanks for watching my video and I hope next season is a good one. Thanks.